Good morning. We begin today's proceedings with general questions, and question number one comes from Annabel Ewing. I ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with ScotRail regarding operations on the Fife Circle. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary met with Dominic Booth of Abilio UK last week, and only this week he uh, met with Alex Hines, the Managing Director of the ScotRail Alliance and his team to discuss the recent rail performance issues across the country. At these meetings, the Cabinet Secretary has stressed that performance must improve immediately to the standards expected by customers and the Scottish Government. Our officials at Transport Scotland meet with the ScotRail regularly to monitor and challenge the performance issues, along with delivery of the many initiatives that will support performance improvement. Annabel Ewing. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answer, but can I just stress, for the avoidance of any doubt, that my constituents are absolutely fed up with ScotRail. Uh, and those in Aberdour and Dalgetty Bay face constant delays, cancellations and overcrowding, as do those in Inverkeith and North Queensferry. And those in Carden Den have to put up with the total farce of not knowing if their train will actually stop in Carden Den, rather than some random station that they have not chosen to go to. This is unacceptable, presiding officer. So can I ask the minister to ensure that the cabinet secretary will now arrange to meet again with ScotRail as a matter of urgency to ensure that as far as the Fife Circle is concerned, that ScotRail gets this back on track. Minister Paul Pilaus. Well, I, I thank uh, Annabel Ewing uh, for that supplementary. I, mean, I, I appreciate, I want to put it on record that uh, both myself and the Cabinet Secretary very much appreciate how frustrating uh, disruption is for passengers and indeed the problems that Annabel Ewing has highlighted in a number of localities in her constituency are obviously of great concern and I can understand how uh, concerned her, her constituents will be. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the Cabinet Secretary has met with Alex Hines earlier this week and will, uh, has also met with the Chief Executive of Network Rail, Alex Haines, uh, Adrian Haines, sorry, uh, several weeks ago and reiterated the need for a robust and resilient plan to deliver improvements across the network and provide customers a reliable railway. I certainly will uh, uh, ha happy to confirm that um, the Cabinet Secretary will meet with Annabel Ewing to discuss the matters uh, and to arrange a meeting with the ScotRail MD as well. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Many constituents in the Five Circle have to endure the crush hour, as it's known, a lack of crews, a lack of stock, a lack of overcrowding, uh, together with cancellations, as already has been indicated, and promises have been broken time and time again. What reassurances can the Minister give to constituents that this intolerable situation will be addressed as a matter of urgency? Minister. Well, I obviously take these matters very seriously, and, and Alexander Stewart is right to raise them on behalf of constituents. Um, what I would say is that significant investment is now being made by the ScotRail Alliance to further improve the resilience of the rail network, including the Fife Circle, through the recommendations from the Donovan Independent Performance Review commissioned earlier this year. The recommendations will support infrastructure, fleet and operational reliability issues across the country. Additionally, the industry is also delivering performance interventions out with the Donovan recommendations, which are more immediate interventions. And some examples across Fife include the Inverkeething Thornton. Uh, uh, five sets of clamp lock points have been renewed. Inverkeething to Ladybank, remote condition monitoring is installed at 10 locations on clamp lock points. Class 158 trains and engine ra radiator failures are being addressed and uh, the, the clutches on the trains are also being looked at. These are all matters which have contributed to the poor performance in that area. And uh, in line with the comments I made to the uh, constituency member uh, for Cowden Beath, uh, Annabel Ewing, uh, we take these matters very seriously and continue to engage with the operators. Mark Ruskell. Thanks. There are four stations on the Fife Circle which are not fully accessible to all users. The Fife Council local communities are hoping to apply for the Access for All Fund. But in recent years, this has only funded the refurbishment of one or two stations per year. At this rate, it will be a generation before we have a fully accessible rail network in Scotland. So can the Minister inform me of any other sources of funding available for this work? And will the Scottish Government consider an accelerated programme to make the Fife Circle and the rest of the rail network in Scotland accessible for all users? Minister. I, I certainly uh, would, would respond to uh, Mr Ruskell and, and recognising the importance of these issues. We all want to see proper access for all users of our, our real network and make sure that any uh, barriers to use of, use of our trains is addressed. Uh, what I will do is uh, commit to uh, Mr Ruskell that uh, once I've been able to uh, have a discussion with the Cabinet Secretary, we'll write to Mr Ruskell with details on, of potential funding options that he has, uh, he has asked for to make sure we're identifying all the potential funding opportunities that could address local difficulties. And I hope that will be helpful to Mr Ruskell. Question number two, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to review the NHS integrated joint board structure. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. 
The integration joint board structure is a partnership between NHS Scotland and local authorities. The review of progress began in May 2018, is led jointly by Scottish Government and COSLA and is expected to conclude in January 2019 when its findings will be presented to the Ministerial Strategic Group for Health and Community Care. Liz Smith. Uh, could I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that helpful answer? Um, does the Cabinet Secretary accept that the significant challenges which are faced by the administration of integrated health and social care demand very clear lines of responsibility and accountability and that the current structures have not been seen to be sufficiently robust in that respect? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful uh, to Ms Smith for her supplementary and indeed for raising this whole question. I think across the country, across our integrated joint boards, what we see is a mixed picture. Um, and so whilst I would not completely agree with Ms Smith on this matter, I am aware that that is the case in some areas. The re remit of the review uh, <laughs> includes looking at finance, governance and commissioning arrangements, delivery and improving outcomes. And it would be my intention that part of uh, the review's uh, focus will be on precisely uh, the matters that she uh, has outlined, which is uh, lines of responsibility and accountability. And I would expect to see uh, the review's assessment of that across all of the, uh, the integrated joint boards and any recommendations that it might have for us and COSLA uh, on how we can improve and make, uh, provide greater clarity on these matters. Question number three, Bob Doris. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports victims of domestic violence in the Maryhill and Springburn constituency. Minister Christina McKelvey. Uh, thank you very much. We are bringing forward new legislation and investing record levels of funding for frontline services to help support victims and survivors of domestic abuse. We fund a range of services in Glasgow, including the Glasgow East Women's Aid, which supports women and children, and the Assist Advocacy Service. We are also working to improve the response of just services and have provided funding to reduce court waiting times for domestic abuse cases and expand the innovative Caledonian programme, a domestic abuse perpetrator programme in Glasgow. Finally, in 2019, we will commence the Domestic Abuse Act, which creates a specific offence of domestic abuse, which will cover not just physical abuse, but also other forms of psychological abuse and coercive and controlling behaviour. Bob Doris. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer. Minister, the Scottish Women's Aid report changed justice fairness. Why should we have to move everywhere and everything because of him? Draws on the experience of women subjected to, to domestic and sexual abuse. It recommends making it easier for women to stay in their own home when practical, instead move the perpetrator, as well as other related recommendations where women are forced to flee domestic abuse. Can I ask the Minister how the Scottish Government is giving serious and significant consideration to these very important matters? And I would note, in doing so, the positive engagement of the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations on this issue. I met with them and Scottish Women's Aid. Minister. Uh, yeah, thank you. I absolutely agree with the member that housing and domestic abuse is a very serious issue. And I am very well aware of the publication he mentions, which is based on research carried out in Fife. In the programme for government, eh, that, that committed us to consulting on further protections for those at risk of domestic abuse through new protective orders that could be used to keep victims of domestic abuse safe by banning perpetrators from their homes. The consultation on this is currently being prepared and will include whether changes are needed to the current system of exclusion orders. And I would urge colleagues across the Chamber and the Federation of uh, Housing Associations and others to take part in that cons cons consultation and raise these issues as part of that process. Number, question number four, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it will respond to the proposals from the five cross-border local authorities regarding a borderlands growth deal. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary met the leaders of the Borderlands Authorities on the 30th of October to discuss their ambitions for a growth deal. Uh, he reiterated our strong support for a Borderlands deal and his desire to see this taken forward. It was agreed to meet again to discuss the next steps uh, and the Cabinet Secretary has uh, had the chance to consider the detail of the proposal. 
Colin Smith. Can I thank the Minister for his answer? The five local authorities involved in the Borderlands deserve great credit for developing their growth deal proposals. However, they were given a deadline of September to su submit those plans with the promise they be considered as part of the UK budget, but sadly that budget did not propose any funding. Can I urge the government to not to make the same mistake and ask them to consider those plans and set out a clear funding commitment in the budget when it's published in December? Minister. Um, the, uh, the, the member, uh, Colin Smith, will probably appreciate that the, what's in the budget is a matter for the Finance Secretary who's sitting in front of me, and uh, to avoid any uh, death stares from Mr Mackay, I will <laughs> avoid giving any figures oh. away right today. Oh, I got one anyway. <laughs> I got one anyway. <laughs> it was a nice smile. Um, but uh, clearly, we, we understand the need for local partners to have as much certainty as early as possible. We are continuing to try and push the UK Government to, to not only to deal with the borderlands deal, but to cover 100% of Scotland with, with uh, growth deals. And so I can assure the member that the Cabinet Secretary will be pushing hard, as he has done with the Tay Cities deal, to get decision from, from UK ministers. June McAlpine. Thank you very much. Given that David Mundell has been talking up a borderlands growth deal for uh, years and uh, the UK budget failed to deliver any money at all, does the minister agree that it reflects very badly on Mr Mundell's influence within the UK cabinet? And furthermore, can he assure us that he will be demanding uh, he will be demanding that any money allocated by the Scottish Government is matched in full by the UK. Yeah, 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 yeah. On the latter part of the question, Minister. <laughs> Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I should also declare an interest as a representative of the South of Scotland, but we, we have made clear our own commitment to the South of Scotland in securing a deal for the borderlands. We are working hard to deliver that deal as quickly as possible, recognising, of course, uh, the need to ensure we're investing in the right things that support inclusive growth. So uh, both Colin Smith and, 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 and Joan McAlpine are right to be uh, keen to see this progress, but it is incumbent on the UK Government to demonstrate they are able to match our commitment to move forward at pace. There have been some encouraging signals from individual UK ministers about delivering 100% coverage of Scotland with growth deals. As yet, a formal UK government commitment to this goal has not been forthcoming, and the Scottish government wants to achieve 100% coverage, as I said in response to Colin Smith. And we stand ready to make that happen with UK government colleagues. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I was pleased that the Chancellor met, mentioned the Borderlands growth deal in his autumn statement. This week, I met with Borderlands champion John Stevenson MP to discuss this specific deal. Many in my constituency believe that there should be more cross-border cooperation, especially concerning infrastructure projects such as the extension of the Borders Railway. Does the Minister agree with me that this growth deal provides a perfect opportunity to develop cross-border connectivity? And will he ensure that the Scottish Government will work with the UK Government to deliver for the people of the borderlands? Minister. Well, uh, I, I certainly um, welcome the latter day conversion of, of the Conservatives the to supporting way. extension of the Borders Railway. Yes. Um, Members across this chamber will remember opposition from those benches in, in past times. But on the sincere point that, that uh, Rachel Hamilton makes about cross-border collaboration, of course we recognise there are opportunities to collaborate on developing uh, a growth deal for borderlands, and we do want to see a successful outcome for uh, local authorities on both sides of the border. It does take uh, commitment from both sides. The Scottish Government has put its commitment forward for all previous growth deals and is committed to match UK Government funding. So it's really, I think uh, it would be good if Rachel Hamilton and her colleagues could press their UK ministers to come forward with commitments about funding as soon as possible. Question number five, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government when the findings of the South West Transport Study will be published. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, the study is well underway. Over 100 representatives from a wide range of stakeholder groups were invited to workshops held in Stranraer, Dumfries and Maybole in October and early November. These were well attended and positive feedback was received from participants. Furthermore, a public online survey has also been highly successful and received over 2,500 responses to date. Um, analytical work is ongoing and it is anticipated that the findings will be published in early 2019 with the emerging outcomes forming part of the evidence base for the strategic, uh, second strategic transport projects review. Brian Whittle. Yeah, can I thank the Minister for that answer? My understanding that that, uh, that will feed into the national transport study. So we're three years before the people in the South West find out if they will get the investment in the infrastructure that they deserve. Now, there is a welcome £3 billion investment in duelling the A9 against a projected £330 million investment in the Mabel Bypass. Given that the A75 and the 77 link the busiest port in Scotland at Cairn Ryan with the rest of Scotland and also into south of the border, isn't it about time the South West's infrastructure needs were met after years of neglect? 
Minister. I was, um, uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I was fortunate to be, to be watching the debate um, on my television set when uh, Michael Matheson was, was discussing uh, the members' debate the other night. Uh, Emma Harper uh, led on the uh, upgrades to road infrastructure in the South West. And Michael Matheson did make the point at that time, we're, we're dealing with a legacy of decades of underinvestment in South West Scotland. Now, this government has made significant investments. I hope Mr Whittle uh, will be open enough to admit that the prog progress in respect of the Dunraggett bypass has helped constituents in the South West of Scotland. But we are, the Cabinet Secretary, and, and uh, I appreciate if I can answer rather than uh, listen to Mr Whittle uh, uh, whittling away from his benches. We are, we are trying to um, uh, address the, the strategic uh, transport needs of the South West of Scotland. The Cabinet Secretary has uh, made very clear this government's commitment to continue to invest in the South West, including the A77, A75, in the debate this week. And I, ho I hope that he will continue to engage with the member on that. Question number six, Bill Kidd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on next month's completion of the rollout of the Universal Credit Full Service. Minister Christina McKelvey. Uh, we have consistently called for the halt of the rollout of universal credit and will continue to do so. Universal credit is pushing people into poverty, rent arrears and hardship. It is simply not fit for purpose, yet the UK government have refused to listen to the overwhelming evidence that it must be stopped until its fundamental flaws are fixed. It is unacceptable that the UK government should carry on with the universal credit regardless of the clear evidence of the damage it is causing the people and the communities across this country. Bill Kidd. I thank the Minister very much for that response. This new rollout is due to start in Drumchapel within my Glasgow Annie's Land constituency on the 5th of December. With families getting caught up in this debacle just three weeks before Christmas and at one of the coldest times of the year, knowing they'll have to deal with a minimum of five weeks delay in receiving their first payment, does the Minister agree with me that this imposition really does beggar the Prime Minister's statement at her party conference that austerity is over? Minister. Uh, Mr Kidd will not be surprised to realise that I do agree with him. Austerity is clearly not over for most people affected by universal credit. The UK government has missed an opportunity to use its budget to address the numerous fundamental flaws with universal credit, including the minimum five-week delay in receiving a first payment. The budget has also missed an opportunity for the benefit freeze to have been lifted with immediate effect and benefits uprated in line with inflation. The benefit freeze has led to a reduction in spending of around $190 million this year and will increase to around 370 million in 2021. For all the people impacted for these cuts, austerity is still in their homes. This was an opportunity to make a much needed change to universal credit that was so desperately needed and has been so desperately wasted by the UK government. Question number seven, Joanne Lamond. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to alleviate homelessness in Glasgow. Cabinet Secretary Aileen Campbell. Ending homelessness and rough sleeping is a priority for this government. We have allocated £23.5 million for rapid rehousing and housing first to support people who are sleeping rough or living in temporary accommodation and to settled accommodation first, then tailor any support they need. Up to £6.5 million of this supports our partnership with Social Bite, who are working with the Cora Foundation, Glasgow Homelessness Network and partners to deliver Housing First pathfinders in five cities, including Glasgow. The Homelessness Prevention and Strategy Group is leading work to publish an Ending Homelessness Together action plan by the end of this year. Joanne Lamond. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary must be all too aware that the Scottish Government has cut the level of funding to groups tackling homelessness in Glasgow by more than £100,000 since 2007. She must also be aware that Glasgow's overall budget has been cut massively in real terms since 2007. And I know that she knows that rough sleeping, the most visible evidence of homelessness, has increased significantly in Glasgow. What representation has she made to the Finance Secretary to ensure that he provides fair funding for Glasgow to allow it to tackle the causes and consequences of homelessness that, and, and all that means for far too many people in communities across Glasgow. Cabinet Secretary. 
I think the £50 million that we have allocated to end uh, homelessness shows absolutely our complete and utter commitment yeah. to end homelessness together, our work with partners across the third sector and our work with local authorities to make sure that we can transform housing policy and eradicate homelessness and, and prevent the unnecessary consequences that arise as a result of that. And of course, I regularly have uh, dialogue and communications with the uh, Finance Minister around that, but I think for a start, I think the, the, the member should recognise 50 million is a significant amount of investment into tackling this issue and will continue to work hard and deliver on the impacts and the uh, recommendations of the Harsai group to make a transformative difference to the people of Glasgow and the people of Scotland. Thank you. That concludes general questions. And before we turn to First Minister's questions, uh, members may wish to join me in welcoming to the gallery the Ambassador of the Republic of Austria to the UK, His Excellency Michael Zimmerman.